So I will introduce Dan really quickly. Um, I met him, oh, I think, five years ago or so now, and we decided to crazy idea to write a DARPA grant together, and um, that was fun, but it led to some funding opportunities where we started to work together. Dan is a professor in the electrical engineering department and a perfect example of an engineer who crossed the, the boundaries here and uh, developed the patience to you know, deal with our requests of our ideal situation, what we could have in the clinical environment for neuroprosthetic technology. So we, I think talk about the the neuroprosthetic technology he's developed in his lab with these DARPA grants, and um, it's amazing work. And uh, with that, I'll let him introduce his talk. Wonderful. Thank you, Anantia. Good afternoon. So today I'm going to talk about technology that is uh, capable of uh, interacting with functional networks of the human brain in a closed loop fashion with a high density uh, interface. Uh, just to use this opportunity to give you a little bit of a kind of a history, I don't know uh, if you're familiar with this, but UCLA is the birthplace of brain computer interfaces, not just the internet. And uh, first brain computer interface uh, experiments uh, that uh, led to the origin of the BCI term were conducted in the computer science department uh, in Professor Jacques Vidal's laboratory. So I think it's important to know. And to give you even more perspective into how we came to where we are today, I'd like to remind you of some of the milestone DARPA technologies that were enabling brain-body interactions. So we have uh, examples here of uh, uh, decoding of uh, neural signals that translate into uh, motion and control of bionic limbs and the famous uh, DARPA DECA arm. Uh, then we have a um, uh, BCI example in today's terms where you have externalized electronics to decode uh, signals from the brain and um, uh, from the motor area and uh, control various uh, navigation uh, tasks on the computer such typing or moving a cursor and things like that or more globally recording signals with the EEG cap. As you can see you know, a few decades later from the 1970s, we are not really that far along in terms of being able to move this really to the next level. So the next level is really to deliver technologies that have adequate clinical efficacy and that are sustainable in the long term to provide improved quality of life for the patient. So that's where DARPA uh, came in to uh, represent President's Brain Initiative back in 2013-14 that Nantia was talking about. And this is one example project, which was one of the inaugural projects in the Brain Initiative, which is DARPA Submits, uh, with a pretty ambitious goal in the DARPA style that we wanted to deliver a platform technology for precise closed-loop therapy in humans suffering from mental health issues and we wanted to develop understanding how we can interact with the functional networks of the human brain and uh, work at the intersect of device technology, clinical neurology, uh, and animal research. So all of that has to happen at the same time where we are confronting uh, the existing status quo, which is the technologies with the four to eight uh, contact interface, which is really continent level of understanding of the human brain and providing an interface that can support more than 200 contacts with a human brain uh, implanted as a chronic medical device over more than two years. DARPA typically has these phase one, phase two things, and for any technology to come to reality of life, you need third revision, which is where DARPA transition programs occur for this to be taken to a product level uh, scale. So we have uh, up to version two in this R&D effort. And this is what we've envisioned under the Summits program to create an end-to-end -end, uh, clinical system which has a lot of interrelated components that would, at the end of the day, provide quantitative assessment of the indication and provide personalized treatment that uh, makes use of intuitive uh, application like uh, mobile mood tracking where a patient can simply express and score a uh, subjective uh, uh, kind of score of their uh, current mental state. And then we have an implantable device that is going to measure biosignals and then offer responsive therapy in a closed loop fashion uh, using a closed loop algorithm, 
which is embedded in the device and uh, serves to uh, modulate functional networks of the human brain, as opposed to single focal regions that are current today's practice uh, and open loop devices. So this is the platform technology that we've developed for the subnets program. So in four years, we've gone from zero to this, uh, to have the full system with um, external tablet touchscreen PC application that uh, allows a clinician to program parameters into this device to select the uh, areas from which recordings need to happen and to prescribe therapy in a form of open loop or closed loop uh, algorithms. And then we have external device to program the implant with uh, modern age technologies for wireless power uh, delivery for the battery charging as well as wireless data telemetry. And then we have aggregation module that uh, serves for the data management. And then we have the neuromodulators that are implanted uh, in the uh, brain uh, on, on the skull that uh, do the closed loop uh, interaction with the brain. So with this device, we can sense multiple locations from the brain, put all of the data into a hub, and then further down into the control module in the chest. Uh, in response, the controller sends power and therapeutic stimulation that is individualized to each patient. So I will highlight a few features of this technology. Uh, this is the neuromodulator unit, which is by far the world's smallest human uh, grade requirement uh, neuromodulation unit that uh, has all of the electronics for sensing of the neural activity, stimulation, and power management for a 64 channel interface. So you have about a dozen of chips which are stacked like skyscrapers on three levels uh, next to each other with hundreds of hair thin wires that are interconnecting all of the uh, signals uh, between these chips. Uh, the electronics is encapsulated in titanium uh, case, which is roughly the size of a vitamin pill that you put on the cranial bone uh, along with uh, the um, uh, leads. And so these are the uh, leads that are assembled together with the electronics. So we call it the concept of smart lead, where you are able to select in a modular fashion the number of uh, any combination of cortical and subcortical leads. And so these are the 64 contact, cortical on the left and subcortical on the right uh, leads that provide high density neural interface. So this is like throwing away a paper map and using a uh, uh, modern navigation tool to really explore uh, the brain and have more of like a country level access going all the way from the continents to improve our understanding, to improve the localization, and be able to um, individualize this to every patient. So these leads are manufactured at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Now I'm going to give you a demonstration of some of these technologies that you can appreciate the challenge of doing this in an academic setting. So this is the first phase version one of the device with sensitive stimulation. Uh, if you can mute the audio here, that would be great. I don't know if you have controls for that. So this is uh, just to give you the, the size of the unit. And this is the whole bench of uh, verification uh, setup here that you have this uh, unit that is put in a, in a pogo pin uh, socket that is kind of really handled very delicately. Uh, then you have the signal generators, power supplies, uh, and then uh, you know oscilloscope to observe the stimulation waveforms, and then you have the PC software that is controlling the whole thing in an in vitro experiment in a beaker to verify the system once it's built. And just to show you, we have the signal generator on the reference probe injecting a neural signal uh, to emulate the neural signal. Then you have 10 volt stimulation and then you are recording uh, with a sensing electronics stimulation artifact and the signal that is injected so that you can do full duplex simultaneous sensing stimulation. So here's the uh, developer version of the user interface. We're programming the amplitude 
Uh, we have uh, four stimulation engines uh, over 16 contacts, and here we have a 3.1 milliamp current that you see. Then you can program similarly the width of this pulse waveform. Uh, then you can also do uh, any uh, waveform engineering, so to speak, to create controlled waveforms. There is really no restriction that we have to abide by to build square waveforms. That's, you know, square is not in nature, so we can put any kind of waveform that you wish to generate and inject in there. Uh, then this is essentially the response to that. Uh, we have an approximation of these kinds of waveforms that would, uh, uh, you would want to play with in your clinical neuroscience or basic neuroscience. Then on top of that, uh, once you enable full duplex sensing and stimulation, we do not blank during stimulation like existing technologies. So I like to say we are really moving away from walkie-talkie technologies to a smartphone technologies where you can do two-way communication with the brain. You have instantaneous response uh, to your stimulation. And in order to do that, you need to clean up the artifacts because artifacts are expressed in the signal band so we've developed an algorithm that is also embedded online on the electronics where you can gather the statistics of the neural signal, take into account that this is a time-varying, non-linear system so that you essentially need to adapt uh, your algorithm. Uh, and we have stimulation waveform agnostic artifact rejection. And then in the phase two, you do adaptive filtering and obtain curves like this without artifact rejection on the left and with artifact rejection on the right, you see the time waveforms on top and spectral waveforms on the bottom so that you can uh, still retain biomarkers in presence of artifacts. Uh, this is the anatomy of the device, so to say, where you kind of de-layer all the components that are going in there with the neuromodulator, the aggregation module, uh, control module, we work with friends from Boston Scientific to use some of the commercial package technologies and really roll out of this R&D technology on a fast time scale. You can see there is a lot of uh, people involved here that are working together uh, on a weekly basis, uh, starting with the UCSF and UCLA that are informing uh, clinical and technical system requirements and specs. And, a system integration uh, uh, for uh, UCLA with a whole bunch of uh, 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 partners that are involved in this. And so this is just the early demonstration of what we want to do when this is the uh, DARPA D60 event, 60 years of DARPA, where you can see on the right, this is the old technology, stimulation is green, and sensing uh, biomarker is in red. You can see that we only sense after the biomarker is detected. You put less energy into the brain in a responsive stimulation, and you extend the battery life and minimize side effects by doing the closed loop. So this is just an early demonstration of the possibility that we can uh, envision for a non-pharmacological treatment of mental health. Uh, this exhibit was at the front line of the uh, BTO, Biosystems Technology Office, at DARPA together with all of the other 60 years prior with the internet and everything else that was happening. So it was nice to uh, experience. Now the vision for the next step is to revolutionize brain therapies and take all these lessons learned from the DARPA where we are now going through qualification process and preclinical testing of this technology to inform the product grade uh, revision 3 implant. That requires no question further miniaturization simplified assembly and even access to single units uh, to uh, enable new indications and um, mainly clinical uh, science. And we are really kind of envisioning this to go toward broad acceptance and kind of cosmetic surgery type of uh, intervention that would reduce the barrier to adoption in patients. Uh, and really, the big picture of this is if you look into the number of people worldwide with various indications, we see insatiable need for better technology. Cochlear technology and uh, Parkinson's disease technology are successful and clinically efficacious because the tools there are at the right scale. But all these other indications, particularly where we require network level access, do not have any technology that is available. And so this is what we see as an opportunity to come in and start with technologies uh, for uh, platform technology to broadly address the space of uh, network scale, opathies, and uh, 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 particularly beginning with experience with mental health. 
And so this is addressing a lot of people. And just to kind of give you a practical number here, the national spending on Alzheimer's, chronic pain, and the depression amounts to the amount of money that you can buy Apple and Google together every single year. So this is the type of societal responsibility that we uh, are looking to, to, to address. Uh, and what we envision is an implant device that is far more miniaturized. It's a platform technology that you can implant seamlessly in a single stage procedure and can be even used as the monitoring device for epilepsy monitoring uh, for the long term. That is also a golden window of opportunity to observe other indications for the scientific translation. Uh, in addition to that, we have external technologies that are governed by uh, IRB protocols for early human verification of sensing and uh, artifact rejection and stimulation policies that we are doing at UCLA. So this is the package technology revision three that is fairly mature. Uh, and where this is really going is uh, beyond impact in medicine, where we want to revolutionize non-pharma therapies for network scale indications. We are thinking that that would really give us also ability to better understand um, uh, the mechanisms of cognition and memory, improve and assist uh, human learning and knowledge. And with that, uh, kind of really go one step closer as a society to a uh, singularity point. So these are the team uh, members uh, from UC San Francisco and UCLA. And we also have consultants with a lot of experience in regulatory and business aspects that all need to be taken into account when developing these kind of R&D technologies that are positioned to transition to the next step. And finally, I would like to leave you here that uh, we need to promote, which is the spirit of SEND, <coughs> deep level interaction between science, engineering, and medicine that where we can take these ideas into our own domains for electrical engineers, these are some of the areas to work on, but we, the end goal to really improve the patient's uh, quality of life and uh, carry on translational science that would help us uh, solve uh, our big um, you know, societal issues. Thank you. So you mentioned a titanium capsule. Would that be MRI compatible? Yes, all the titanium medical grade uh, components are biocompatible. So all the components will be going through standard battery of uh, sterility verification, biocompatibility, active animal testing, and uh, histopathology, all of that for, for the IDE uh, submission. Is there an idea on when we can expect uh, the first implant in a human brain? Uh, next year. Yeah, so the IDE should be submitted in March, end of March, and so it's about three month turnaround, so sometime Q3 of next year would be the first in human. But at the same time, we also need to evolve the next generation technology, because in this area, you can never start too early, and it takes time to develop the IDE to really go after product level uh, IDE that many people can use. This is really kind of just the breaking the ice and learning experience for on that, on that path.